So most of chapter one should be a review of general chemistry, but depending on who you are and how long it's been since you've taken general chemistry, a lot of this uh, may be important for you to go through. Uh, a lot of it you may want to go through kind of quickly if, it, if you just finished general chemistry and all this stuff is very fresh in your mind, then you can go through this part maybe a little bit faster. So if we start with atomic structure, you just want to be reminded that three different particles make up our atoms. We have electrons, we have protons, and we have neutrons. And if you look at each one of these things, protons define the element that you're working with. Neutrons define the isotope of that element. Elements, of course, we'll work with a lot in here. Isotopes we won't talk about a whole lot um, in lecture class, but when we look at mass spectrometry during lab, we'll talk more about isotopes and about different neutrons. We'll talk more about carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14, that sort of thing. And electrons define ions. Of course, the other part about electrons that's really valuable is that electrons define nearly all chemical reactions. Okay, so nearly all chemical reactions occur by sharing or transfer of electrons. The only ones that are different are nuclear chemistry reactions, and we won't talk uh, at all about nuclear chemistry uh, during the organic chemistry. Uh, hopefully we remember also that our atomic mass really comes from all the protons and neutrons. Uh, and all the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. And the electrons are all in orbitals around the nucleus. Hopefully, if you made it through general chemistry, you already understand that the periodic table is extremely useful in understanding chemistries of different atoms and different elements. So we'll review a little bit about the periodic table. In my class, I never hand out periodic tables to students for any quizzes or exams. There are roughly 12 or 13 elements that I expect my students in organic chemistry to know, and we'll talk about them, you know, uh, many of them, nearly every day. Uh, and outside of that, I don't expect them to remember or memorize the rest of the periodic table. But let's talk about the periodic table. So a period is a row, and a group is a column. And what's important is that elements in the same period are roughly the same size, while elements in the same group have similar chemical and electronic properties. So which elements do you need to know for organic chemistry? Hydrogen, lithium, sodium, and potassium are all going to be common ones in the metals. Probably magnesium and calcium also. And then when we come over to the right side of the periodic table, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So what do we need to know for each one of these? The first thing we need to know is the number of valence electrons. Right, and in fact, I was talking with a general chemistry class this last year, and I told them that if you ask me how many electrons an element has, I'll probably get the answer wrong being an organic chemist, because the only thing I ever care about or think about are the number of valence electrons, which are the outer shell electrons. Now, the nice thing about that is that the periodic table can tell us that really quickly for, e for each group. So if I look at the group of halogens here, they all have seven valence electrons. If I look at oxygen and sulfur, they have six. Nitrogen and phosphorus has five. Carbon and silicon have four. Boron and aluminum have three. Then I come over and skip all the transition metals and look at the alkaline earth elements. These all have two electrons 
and the alkali metals all have one electron as well as hydrogen which doesn't really fit with the other alkali metals but uh, that's where it sits on the periodic table so you can look really quickly at, at the column that they're in or the group that they're in and you can tell how many valence electrons each element has and that's going to be really important and this will lead us to help understand better something that we'll talk about soon but not right away which is the number of bonds each makes. That'll be really important as we start drawing Lewis structures of things. So then too we need to think about where, where our electrons are and whether they're in an s orbital or a p orbital. Now you remember there are also d orbitals in f. Uh, we will rarely use d and f orbitals in organic chemistry. Nearly everything is going to happen at s and p orbitals. So if you remember how electrons fill, they'd fill, the 1s would fill first, then the 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p. That's far enough to go for now. And the magic question, of course, is why? And if you heard me say why, hopefully you figured it out. The 4s orbital is lower energy than 3d. So that one fills first. So that's why we get a strange order for how, how the orbitals fill is by lower energy. But then we should remind ourselves what the orbitals look like. So I'll draw some simple drawings of what they look like, but if you look at page 10 in the fourth edition textbook or uh, look hopefully somewhere in chapter one of whatever textbook that you're using, there'll be some pictures of what the orbitals look like. But an S orbital is just a sphere, while a P orbital is dumbbell shaped. And it's not like an infinity sign, it's three-dimensional. So I'm, I'm drawing as best I can. Now, but usually when we'll draw these, we'll, I'll draw them uh, two-dimensionally, even though we know that they're three-dimensional structures. Now, of course, there are three different p orbitals. There's one s orbital only, but there are three different p orbitals. And the three p orbitals we call the px, py, and pz orbitals. One of them is up and down. One of them would be on its side. Or horizontal and vertical. The third one, and I draw it as best I can, is actually coming in and out of the plane. So, so this this lobe is coming out at you, and this one's going back away into the, into the plane of the paper or the board. Okay, now I don't make you do calculations in organic chemistry, and in fact, uh, you should never need a calculator in organic chemistry, at least not in my class. However, it's instructive to think about why. Why do these orbitals look like this? Why do we say that a 1s orbital is a sphere or that a p orbital is dumbbell shaped? Really, we have Schrodinger to thank for that. Uh, and Schrodinger defined a wave equation for the electrons. Uh, and the issue is that electrons act as particles and as waves. 